I beg you to try it, Patricio. Let me get this straight, Carla. You disagree on the weapon, you disagree on the number of blows. <laughs> Listen to me, Patricio. You dare once in your life. Hey, people, Trish Wood here. And this is the Trish Wood is Critical podcast, born of my utter and absolute and total angst about the failure of legacy media, which is something I talk about a lot. The show has morphed a bit into a criticism of legacy or mainstream media, whatever you want to call it, because it it kind of feels like the self-destruction ball is rolling downhill and it's getting faster and faster and faster and faster. It's a terrible thing to behold. It's upsetting for me as a former journalist. Somebody wrote and they said, Trish, you're always saying how good things were before. And, you know, I, I'm not saying journalism was perfect back in my day, but I will repeat this one thing that I've said about my time at CBC and elsewhere, but specifically at CBC where I did my best work. Uh, I was never told that I couldn't report a story I wanted to report. I was never told to remove things for a political reason or because there was some other agenda going on. Never. I mean, I know we love to hate the CBC and the CBC is enormously hateable right now. I'm on board with that. But the reason it is enormously hateable right now is because it used to be so good. Yes, left of center. It's always been left of center. It attracts those kind of people. And journalism and the world of documentaries has traditionally attracted people who are left of center, a kind of I want to save the world by telling stories mentality, which is me. I mean, that's totally who I am. But the left has changed. It's not that being a lefty back in the day was so bad because we were championing or trying to champion the underdog against the powerful forces at play in our country. And what better job to have as a journalist than being the bulwark between the citizenry and the powerful apparatuses that run our lives? That's what we did. But what's happened subsequently, as you all know, is that the left has changed and now sees the world through a very, very ideological framework that distorts and contorts reality and indeed morality in the way it handles things. There are many, many things wrong in our country right now and in America And well, in the West, generally, let's just put it that way. And I think for many of the people who listen to this program and the people that I talk to, experts and activists and others on a on a pretty daily basis in this job, that we all recognize an important factor. And the important factor is that governments in the West no longer govern for the citizenry. This is not a conspiracy theory. (laughs) They are governing for some other reason, for the managerial class's ideas about what the world should be. And we, we know this because most people are against wide open immigration. Canadians and Americans and the Brits love immigration, love diverse communities. No one has ever really, I mean, there are fringe people who are mean about it, but We all were in agreement about that until, what, five years ago when all of a sudden all the guys who go to Davos and the G whatever number it is now meetings are wanting to open the borders to so-called migrants. A new change in the language, too, which should always give you pause when they change a word. It means it's for some usually political or ideological reason. And all of all of a sudden, we have to just accept that and be quiet. And they lie about it. Joe Biden lies about the border every day. Karine Jean Pierre lies about the border every day. It's it's ridiculous. I, I saw a story last night that said that. I mean, I couldn't. I almost couldn't believe it. Fifty percent of the hotel rooms in New York City are now housing migrants. 
what is going on? These are not American citizens. America has a homeless crisis of people living and defecating on the street, and they're putting people who enter the country illegally up in New York City hotels. What? So my point was before I went on that little digression. Oh, they're doing that in the uh, the UK as well. They're putting migrants up in hotels and people's weddings are being canceled. They've booked the room and booked the banquet room a year ago for their nuptials and they're being canceled at the last minute because migrants need the rooms. It's, It's awful. So my point about this is that it would seem that the people who are governing in the West are no longer governing for the citizenry. What they do does not reflect what most people are thinking, even in the face of these crazy polls that they do. Because if you ask people what they think about something, they'll give you an answer that's usually reflective of the idea they think that government's kind of nutty. I mean, the elites all kind of love what governments are doing, but the rest of us are like, wait a minute. Uh, and the polls don't even accurately reflect the the kind of dissonance of that because always bear in mind, probably more than half than the people being polled are being propagandized by legacy media too. So they don't even have a clear view. I mean, remember this, Joe Biden has been saying for two years, there's no problem at the Southern border. Kamala Harris, who's supposed to be in charge of it, doesn't even go there. So anybody who watches the shows in America that proffer those lies and peddle those lies to their listeners and viewers would think that everything at the border is fine. Make no mistake. I bet that up until maybe a couple of weeks ago when um, this new change in law happened that was allowing more and more migrants to cross at the border, most Americans didn't even know there was a problem there, or many Americans didn't know, because what you know and what your reality is is shaped by the media that you consume. So that's my point. They're not governing for the citizenry. They have their own agenda. I think they think we're a bunch of morons and they're going to run the show the way they want to run it. They run on a platform to get elected and then it's kind of screw you. We're going to do what we want. That seems to be what they're doing municipally too. I didn't vote to lose every parking lot in midtown Toronto and have every corner tearing down a lovely Victorian building to put up a hideous apartment block that looks like the brutalist architecture of the Pripyat city, which was the Chernobyl, Ukraine city. If you've seen the photographs of those awful cement apartment buildings, that's what Midtown Toronto is like now. It's been handed over. No one asked us. No one cares. Everybody I talk to on the street is absolutely ruined by it, traumatized by the noise, but they're going ahead. The city's going ahead regardless of what we think. So you've got to bear that in mind. And we have to try to figure out why that happened and how that is being enabled. What's going on? And the the short answer is mainstream media, legacy media. Politicians have figured out that they can lie to us and get away with it because mainstream media doesn't call them out on issues that matter to us. So that is where we're headed. And nowhere is that more obvious than in the United States, our brothers and sisters to the south of this border. And I think at no time in history has it been more obvious than since the release of the Durham report, which essentially says everything that Donald Trump has been saying for years and that many of us knew early on because we were skeptical about the coverage. And that is that Russia Gate was a hoax perpetrated by Hillary Clinton's campaign against her political rival and bought into and nurtured and supported by legacy media, the intel agencies and their retired spooks who were commentators on those shows, the FBI, remember James Comey, remember Peter Strzok, remember Andrew McCabe, remember all those people 
fired, let go, whatever. And then interestingly, you may have forgotten this, but they all got, or most of them got anyway, a GoFundMe campaign. You were, you know, they put up these campaigns where you could support the legal fund of these people who had completely derailed democracy in America. You know who else got one was the woman who testified against um, the Supreme Court nomination with her story of being abused by him. That was not credible at all. But she got a GoFundMe too that was almost $700,000. It's almost like these GoFundMes for Democrat people who are towing the line are a payoff. It does feel that way. And it did to me at the time. But if we look now at what the Durham report is saying, it's saying that there was no, to use their phrase, there was no there there. In other words, it was a manufactured story that occupied the citizenry, the media, the political class, what Trump would call the deep state, everybody was obsessed with Trump Russia, and it was all a big fraud. And here is the sad part of that. And this is true. If you ask people who are consuming media on the other side of of the aisle about the Durham report, they don't even know what it is. They have no clue what you're talking about. They have no idea that the Russiagate story has been, to use their phrase, D. Bunk. They don't know. So where does that leave us now? We're in two solitudes of information, two silos of information. And even though this report was dropped, that was massively decisive, saying things we all knew anyway, Greenwald and Taibbi and many, many other smart indie journalists, many of them former leftists, or I guess they would still say they were lefties, actually, uh, exposed it, as did others. And there was a great uh, Columbia Journalism Review multi-part piece talking about how badly the media failed. And we're going to interview the writer of that piece, I hope, next week. He's not been feeling well, so we're hoping to get him on next week. But if here, here's what I want to talk about today. And it's about one logical idea following from another, which is to say critical thinking. That's what we do here. If this whole story was a made-up fairy tale, a fabrication, a tissue of lies, as I heard somebody say yesterday, then how did the reporters who were reporting it as true put those stories together? How is it possible? Think about it for a minute. The New York Times won a Pulitzer Prize for a story that's untrue. It's not they got a part of it wrong. It never happened. Putin never helped Trump. Right? There was no server. There was no all the dumps. There was the dossier was fake. None of it was true. None of it was true. It was all perpetrated originally by Hillary Clinton, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Because nobody's really dumping on her, are they? There, there you go. I mean, what more evidence do you need that this was a kind of coup, a political coup in a sense, which might sound so contradictory, but it, but it was a political coup. Hillary Clinton was really upset that she got busted because the DNC was cheating on her behalf, and we're going to unpack that a little bit later in the show. But that's what seeded this story and they carried it on and carried it on. So the question is, and this shows how deeply, deeply corrupt the media is. If the story was false, which it was and is, where were they getting their information? Who were these confidential sources they were relying on? That's what they were saying. A confidential source, CNN, a confidential source tells us that Trump, blah, 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 blah. Who were they? Here's what I will say about that as a former journalist. Whoever their sources were had been lying to them for years. And now that we know that those sources were lying, the journalists who used them to perpetuate the destruction of a presidency, 
and the individual behind the presidency. I mean, I don't know how Donald Trump is still standing. I know he's flawed. I'm not completely defending him, but that's, as I say, I'm about fair play here. He, you know, he may not be the right guy to run the country, but that's not my deal. I, I'm not here to make that assessment right now. I'm talking about how he was treated by mainstream media. It's not up to them to pick the president. And it's not up to media to collude. They were the ones colluding, right? To collude with the deep state, the Hillary campaign, in order to ensure that uh, Trump couldn't govern for those years that he was in office. I mean, it's actually shocking. So the media now have an obligation to out those sources. I don't know why people aren't calling for that. People should be calling for that. Once a source lies to you, you have no obligation whatsoever to hide their identity. You just don't. You just don't. So isn't it interesting that nobody's mad at their sources? I haven't seen Jake Tapper or any of the folks at CNN, Anderson Cooper, doing a piece to camera saying, oh my God, we were bamboozled by the deep state or whatever you want to call it, the Trump-hating coup people. They're not doing that. They, they've been caught red-handed, but they're not, they're not doing that. They're not doing that. And you know what that tells us? It tells us that they knew what they were doing. This was not an innocent mistake. If it was an innocent mistake, they would be mortified. Heads would be rolling, wouldn't they? Is Chris Licht, the new head of CNN News, going to fire any of the people who got that story wrong? Rachel Maddow was rehired about a year ago, uh, and she's working a shorter work week and making double, I think she's making like $12 million a year or something. I mean, it's ridiculous. Make no mistake. This is not legacy media in Canada or in the UK, namely the BBC and ITV. Here, the CBC and CTV and, and Global. Um, making a mistake with a bad source. This was a, a whole industry built around bringing down the Trump presidency and people were paid enormous amount of money to do it. I think we should, number one, demand that they reveal their sources. Now they don't deserve protection. And number two, I think going forward, we need to put a salary cap on how much these people make. If you're making 10 million a year and someone wants you to go after a sitting president, they don't say it you know, oh, here, we're going to pay you money to do this. Is that how it goes down? They get you used to making big money, and then they start seeding ideas of how things should happen. And everybody in Washington and New York in the legacy media figured out that going after Trump was a very lucrative business. And so the more they did it, the more money they made, the more people hated Trump, and there is your business loop right? Make people hate Trump and demand more anti-Trump coverage because they hate him. That's what happened here. Again, he has a ton of faults and he's his own worst, worst enemy in many ways. And I will never, ever forgive him for his COVID policy. I know from people who were there that his natural inclination was toward focused protection and stopping the lockdowns and school closures, but he didn't do it. And I think he didn't do it because he made a political calculation and that's not good. We do not like that. So, you know, I am not a brazen Trump supporter. But I do think the media going along and being part of what was essentially a coup attempt against a sitting president is indicative of America actually being a failed state. I, I think it is a failed state. I, we can't believe anything any of them say. Biden's a liar. Corinne Jean-Pierre's a liar. Mayorkas is a liar. Don't believe your don't believe your lying eyes as you're seeing fifteen thousand migrants crossing the border. It's not happening. Don't don't believe that. 
Joe Biden is demented. We can all see it. It's not even like a mystery or a, you know, or a something hidden. Let's put it that way. It's right out in the open, but nobody talks about it. The media go along and go along, go along. They should be calling for him to do a test. And they're not because they're not fair brokers. They are the arm of the Democratic Party, which, you know, it sounds bad, but it actually is really bad because you've got a bunch of incompetent bunglers, dishonest, incompetent bunglers now running America. And I include lots of GOP people in there, too. Are they calling for Biden's impeachment over dementia and other things? Like his corruption, maybe? No, not really. Nope. It's all just going along just fine. Failed state. Everybody's getting rich. Media gets rich. Rachel Maddow gets rich. Jake Tapper gets rich. Biden family's getting rich. All the GOP slugs are getting rich from their donors at Raytheon and keeping the war in Ukraine going while people die. I mean, it's a disgusting thing. And the Durham report for me is, I was going to say the final nail in the coffin, but I think I nailed the coffin shut over COVID. But now we're burying the coffin, you know, rest in peace, legacy media journalism, because you are dead, dead, dead. So on today's show, that's what we're going to talk about. I've got some really interesting tape for you to hear, just to remind you of the crazy four years we've lived through. And um, also Marianne Cloak gave evidence at the National Citizens Inquiry, brave lady. We broke her story on this show some time ago. She called me. She'd been a reporter at CBC News. She retired early because of the way they were handling COVID in a dishonest way. And so we're going to replay a couple of clips from that show just to really drive home what's going on here. I mean, my goodness, she just wanted to report on some vaccine injuries. People are injured by every pharmaceutical product, every pharmaceutical product, but you couldn't say those things about the vaccines, the COVID vaccine. You couldn't say them. So she will be, well, she won't physically be back, but we're going to play some of her, her comments on the show when we first had her on and she did the NCI yesterday. So you should hunt down that tape on their website. I'm sure they've posted it. By now, Rodney Palmer dropped a few more bombs on uh, legacy media, too, and the experts they choose to buttress various narratives. So that was quite interesting. But we're going to hear from Marianne again. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the Bobby Kennedy issue and how that has exposed yet another legacy media journalist as someone who has no clue how to do the job. It was another horrible interview by a legacy media journalist thinking she's going to lay a glove on Bobby. Look, I don't agree with everything about Bobby. I have big questions for Bobby about things he said in the past. Has he washed the slate clean on some of those issues? I'd really like to know. And should he ever agree? I actually haven't requested an interview with him in all this time, but I will eventually and have him on, I hope. But but the questions for him are not about autism and vaccines. You're never going to win that argument with him. He's just too smart and too well-researched. Even if he's wrong, he may, he may well be wrong. But a journalist is not going to win that argument with him. So we're going to talk about how the strategy of someone named Crystal Ball, yes, that's really her name, on a podcast called Breaking Points. She does with Sagar and Jetty, who I have a lot of time for. And yet again, Bobby Kennedy gets the best of them. It's like Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner. The anvil always drops on the coyote instead of on the Roadrunner. So that's that's kind of what interviewing Bobby Kennedy is like, if you don't know what you're doing. You know, these people are so caught up in their own image. I'm going to be the one to bring down Bobby Kennedy and his vaccine heresy. You know, I never, nope not going to happen. So we'll play a little bit of that. And I'll talk to you about what my strategy would have been had I, I have interviewed Bobby Kennedy before. I think I've said that on a beach in um, Vancouver Island in Clackwood Sound uh, on a beach. He was there for some environmental situation going on and he was given a nice award by the local 
First Nations people who I think were maybe Haida or Tinglet. I, I can't remember. Forgive me if you're listening which tribe it was, but it was a lovely event. And um, I interviewed him on the beach there for the Fifth Estate. I will say he is pretty good looking. At least he was then. And um, he does carry the whole weight of the Kennedy family history around with him, whether he likes it or not. He looks like his dad. He spe- now he's got a, a voice issue of some sort, a medical issue. But uh, in those days, he looked and sounded and had the same countenance as his father, Bobby. So that was quite a moment for me. I wasn't quite tongue tied, but I, you know, I was close. A li- you know, I could have. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes those things just happen when you're a female reporter, you know, and I'm sure it happens to men too. Um, Morgan Freeman is the other interview I've done where I was so bowled over by his presence and handsomeness and voice that I was, I probably acted like an ass, but whatever. He was a nice guy. It's terrible when they aren't nice people. That's the sad thing about meeting and interviewing celebrities that you admire is they, they usually turn out to be duds. And you walk away thinking, why did I ever like that person? So that's what we're doing today. I don't have a guest. You're going to hear tape instead. And we're going to talk about a few things that I think are really important, like the attempted coup, actual coup, really. It was actually a coup in America. Trump won fair and square. And I don't think he lost fair and square in 2020. I don't think he did. I know you're not allowed to say that. I'm an election denier. But I, I, I don't think he lost given all of the tricks they used around the mail-in voting and everything else. But um, that dog won't hunt, as they say. That that has been effectively killed. That narrative has been effectively killed by legacy media. You're not allowed to question it. So I'm going to do my pitch, and then we'll come back, and I will play you a tape also about election denial and how that was perfectly okay in 2016. In fact, there were riots over it. So just to remind you. So uh, here's my pitch. Uh, I have a website, which is trishwoodpodcast.com. We post the show there too. We have a merch store there. You can buy cool stuff, some of it trucker related. Uh, uh, The podcast is carried on almost every possible platform. And we do download to YouTube sometimes too, so you can find it there. And let me just say this on YouTube, this kind of bugs me, but on YouTube, you'll see we've got two or 300 people who've listened to it. That's not our main platform, people. We are growing and growing and growing. We have a nice, juicy, big audience now. Um, And so I debated on leaving the show or not, because people, if I'm booking an important guest, maybe they'll go and say, who is this chick? And they'll look at YouTube and they'll say, well, only 300 people listen. Why am I doing her dumb show? But at that, those numbers do not reflect what we're doing here. So don't be, don't be discouraged. We have a growing and devoted audience, which I'm very, very, very grateful for. And you know why? I got to meet Tamara Leach last night. We had dinner together and that was really something. I will talk more about her on another show, but I feel very, very lucky to do this show and meet people like like she. So we are funded, as PBS says, by listeners like you. And uh, we don't take advertising yet, although we probably will in the future. Carefully curated uh, commercial enterprises, obviously. So you can um, support us if you so choose. I hope you do, because we are the antidote to what we're going to be talking about today. And the antidote isn't just indie media, because some indie media is crap. I mean, seriously, it is. You know, for every Matt Taibbi or Greenwald or or Leighton Woodhouse or Michael Schellenberger or David Zweig or Paul Thacker, those are kind of my greatest hits. Oh, Cy Hirsch, those are my faves right now. For, so for every one of them, there's probably 20 or 30 who are more even, I should say more, who are not very good and not very honest and a little bit out there. Let's just say that. So you do have to curate your feeds, right? Of who, which indies you're, you're going with. But um, we work hard here to make sure that we are not falling into some of the informational traps that are being uh, set for us all. And I, I, you know what I'm proud of? I'm really proud of our COVID coverage. I gave up a career as a film director, producer, 
documentaries, which I was kind of tiring of anyway. It's, it can be awful. It can be an awful job. It's also great, but it's hard work to focus on a podcast, on this podcast, in fact, that has brought you very well curated COVID information for two and three years. And I hear from you all the time about how much it's meant to you. But that's work. You know, I, I weeded out some of the COVID cranks and there were many COVID cranks. And I think you got on this show a pretty good representation of the heretical science underpinned mostly by the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, who were right. And we were, I think we were maybe the first person outside of the event itself to actually interview Kaldorf and Bhattacharya. So Netra we could never get, but... So, so you're getting, you know, it might seem easy, but it's not. In order to book a guest, I, I spend maybe a day or two reading about them to make sure there's no skeletons in the cupboard, as Hugh Grant would say. Um, so, you know, we're, I hope I make it sound easy. That's the gift of somebody who knows what they're doing, and I do, after decades in the business and as a broadcaster, but, but we do the work. We do the work here. So um, please go to my Substack and support us through Substack. Let me explain that too. I do write for Substack once in a while. Uh, and I do it because it is a free speech platform. It is not wobbly about free speech. It is committed to free speech. I've never been bugged. They don't shut people down the way lots of the other sites do. So Substack deserves our support. Obviously, they take a cut of what you send me, but they should because they have been standing tall for free speech for a very long time, way before most people were even worried about it. So you can go there and do that. You can buy merch from our cool little store on my website. You can follow me on Twitter, which is at Wood Reporting. And um, we'd love to see you there too. So please do that. And um, I do want to say that I will be reading a lovely note I got from one of you at the end of the show today as well. And um, thank you for your kind words about my interview with Thomas, my firstborn, who really struggled through the lockdowns. And of course, and he did it here in my home. Uh, and so that was underpinning some of my darker days. I know many of you were wondering what was going on, and that's what it was. We were trying to get this guy sober and save his life, and, and we did. I mean, he did. Not we. He did it, but we were trying to facilitate it. So I'm, I'm glad that that was useful for people who uh, listen to it, and thanks for your kind words. Okay. Putting the box and gloves back on again. I mean, this is horrific. <laughs> the media coverage. So I, and I don't want to let it go because I want to just really, really explain for you the mass psychosis that was affixing itself to legacy media about Donald Trump. So I'm going to play for you. This is a clip that I put in the last Substack I wrote because it's, it's important. It's important. It's Jake Tapper of CNN interviewing Robbie Mook, M-O-O-K, who is Hillary's campaign manager on the eve of the Democratic National Convention. So here's what's happened. In the previous weeks, WikiLeaks has published a tranche of emails that were taken from the DNC. And the emails showed that the DNC had been conspiring for Hillary Clinton against her biggest competitor, Bernie Sanders. There was real fear back then that Bernie could win. He had a lot of support. He had my support. Isn't that weird? <laughs> he did. <laughs> but I changed my mind. But, um, you know, he, there was real fear that he could win. And the DNC was doing everything in their power to make sure that he didn't completely, completely subsuming the democratic process. But these emails showed that. So she looked bad. I mean, I think Hillary Clinton always looks bad, but she looked worse than usual. And so Jake Tapper, in a very namby-pamby fashion, was asking 
Robbie Mook about the emails. And in order to kind of divert attention, you know, a misdirection as a magician will say, he gives a very short answer to the emails and what they expose and reverts to Russia did it for Trump. That's when they're seeding this narrative into legacy media. And let me just say, as you're listening to this, so you know, Julian Assange, who I trust more than just about anybody in the world right now, has said on Dutch TV and elsewhere that those emails, number one, were not hacked. They were not hacked. Um, They were downloaded, it would seem, and that they did not come from Russia or any state actor. So everything Robbie Mook is saying here is a lie. So let's let's hear the clip. Joining me now is Clinton campaign manager Robbie Mook. Robbie, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. My pleasure. So I have to ask, what is the reaction of the Clinton campaign to these DNC leaked emails suggesting that top officials, including the CFO there, were actively discussing ways to to hurt Bernie Sanders in the primaries? Well, I think the DNC needs to look into this and take uh, appropriate action, and I'm sure that they will. What's disturbing to us is that we uh, experts are telling us that uh, Russian state actors broke into the DNC, stole these emails, and... uh, uh, other experts are now saying that they are the Russians are releasing these emails for the purpose of actually helping Donald Trump. I don't think it's coincidental that these emails were released uh, on the eve of our convention here. And and that's disturbing. Uh, and I think we need to be concerned about that. I think we need to be concerned that we also saw uh, at last week at the Republican convention that Trump and his allies made changes to the Republican platform uh, uh, to make it more pro-Russian. And, and we saw him talking about how NATO shouldn't intervene to defend necessarily necessarily should intervene to defend our Eastern European allies if they're attacked by Russia. So I think when you put all this together, it's a it's a disturbing picture. And I think voters need to reflect on that. What evidence is there that the Russians were behind this in terms of the hacking or in terms of the timing by WikiLeaks? Well, I, I, we need to let the experts speak on this. It's been reported on in the press uh, that the that the hackers that got into the DNC are very likely to be uh, working in coordination uh, with Russia. And again, I, I think it's if the Russians, in fact, have these emails again, I don't think it's very coincidental that they're being released at this time to 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 create maximum damage uh, on Hillary Clinton and to help Donald Trump. But it's a very, very strong charge that you're leveling here. <clears throat> you're basically suggesting that Russians hacked into the DNC and now are releasing these files through WikiLeaks to help elect Donald Trump. Well, this isn't my assertion. Uh, there are a number of experts that are asserting this. I think we need to get to the bottom of these facts. But that, that is what experts are telling us. Experts have said that it is the Russians that, in fact, went in and took these emails. And, and then if, if, if they are the ones who took them, we have to infer that they are the ones then, then releasing them. Internally at the DNC, what repercussions should there be? How would you feel if you were running Bernie Sanders' campaign and you saw that the DNC, while claiming to be neutral, was actively talking about ways to hurt him? Well, as I said, the DNC needs to take appropriate steps, and I'm confident that they will. I'm really proud of the primary that we ran. I was at the Rules Committee yesterday. Uh, The Clinton campaign and the Sanders campaign were working hand-in-hand to create a unified rules report. We worked in Orlando to create a unified platform. We're really proud of that. I think you're going to see unity at this convention in strong contrast to what we saw at the Republican convention. And, and I, that, again, that is something that we're very proud of. You, you're still not answering the question about what appropriate action would be. So I, I just want to point out a couple of weasel words used by, by Robbie Mook. One of them was the repeated use of the word expert. And I can explain to you who those experts were. Uh, and the other one is the idea that that they've been assured that this has happened. He's asserting they've been assured that this has happened, but he won't say who the experts were or what their what their expertise was. So here is what I know about that, just so you can fully understand how complex this is. When the DNC was um, breached, let's put it that way, because there's good evidence they weren't hacked at all that it was downloaded. As I said, it's, it's um, a security veterans for peace or something, one of those groups who analyzed the metadata and said, that's no way this was a hack. It was downloaded onto a thumb drive by somebody probably at the DNC, maybe Seth Rich even, who knows. But but um, they what the DNC did, and this is why it's so fishy, instead of calling in the FBI, who they should have, the, the computer people, the specialists within the FBI, they didn't let the FBI take the server at all. 
They, they, they refused to let the FBI take this over. What did they do? They called in a company called CrowdStrike to do an analysis. And as I understand it, they said enough to be able to give Robbie Mook this talking point. But then later, years later, under oath, the head of CrowdStrike denied that that ever happened. It's very, very interesting. So no, the police can't have it, but we'll hire somebody privately and we'll say they said this, but then later he will deny it. So, ugh, right? No experts, not hacked. But what they're doing is they are seeding the idea ahead of the election that Donald Trump is getting help from Russia and Putin. That's all the Clinton campaign. That's Robbie Mook doing that. So I want to move on now. I have a great little, it's called a supercut uh, done by uh, a new contributor to our show. His name is Matt Orphalea. And Matt Orphalea is a kind of a video researcher and editor. He does lots of work for Matt Taibbi. And I was looking for a way to illustrate how deeply, deeply, deeply this PSYOP penetrated into the media and the public that Trump was compromised, that the election which he won, as I understand it, fair and square in 2016, was actually compromised, and that he was, in the words of lefty media, an illegitimate president. So here's this is a fun little supercut that was done by Matt Orphalea, uh, kind of cataloging some of the statements that were said. Now, obviously, this is audio and not video. You can't see the faces, but you'll recognize many of the voices A lot of them are Dem politicians, legacy media hosts, etc. The usual suspects are all in there. But it's shocking. And I'd forgotten there was even some riots on Inauguration Day. I forgot that, right? We do, don't we? So listen to this. This is um, a supercut put together for us by Matt Orphalea about what happened after Trump was elected, given the massive propaganda campaign and the seeding of this coup started by the Hillary Clinton campaign. So if we're all in agreement that it is incorrect to say the 2020 election was stolen, what about the 2016 election? Look, I'm not going to go back into history. It was a stolen election. It was stolen. Stolen. He's an illegitimate president. He's an illegitimate president. You know, pretending to be president. Why do you think the president is going to such great lengths to essentially prove that he beat you? Because he didn't. One third of Clinton supporters say Trump election is not legitimate. I think he's an illegitimate president that didn't really win. You are absolutely right. You can run the best campaign. You can even become the nominee. And you can have the election stolen from you. The 2016 election was stolen. Got a nicer way to say that? Say Russia hacked the election. Russia hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. A little louder, please. Russia hacked our election. That was a 9-11 scale event. This was a kind of cyber 9-11. A cyber 9-11. Yes. Russia hacked our election. Russia, you know, of course, hacked our election here. Half of Clinton's voters believe the conspiracy theory that Russia hacked election day votes. We know that they were into voting roles actual interference with the elections themselves. We know it happened. Despite no credible evidence, 67% of Democrats believe Russia tampered with vote tallies. Hacking the U.S. election. Hacking the U.S. election. Russia hacked our election. The Russians hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. Russian hacking of our election. Hacking of our, our, of our election. Russia hacked our elections. Russia hacked our elections. The stolen election. Russia hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. The universal assessment that Russia hacked our election 2016. Foreign governments hacked our elections. Most young Americans consider Donald Trump an illegitate president. An illegitimate president. He's an illegitimate president. Why is he See, illegitimate? He just won an election. He's an illegitimate president in my mind. That's it. I absolutely agree. Experts urge Clinton Kent to challenge election results. We will see how illegitimate his victory actually was. He's an illegitimate president. Russia hacked our election. Russians hacking our election. Hacked our election. Russia hacking our election. I don't see the president-elect as a legitimate president. Trump is an illegitimate president who stole the election. He is not a president. He's illegitimate. And my biggest fear is that he's going to do it again with the help of Vlad, his best pal. It's terrifying. Would you be my vice presidential candidate? <laughs> Hillary Clinton voted 
voters' call to overturn election results. More than 4 million people have already signed a petition on change.org calling for the electors of the Electoral College to, quote, ignore their states, vote and cast their ballots for Secretary Clinton. Trump didn't actually win the election in 2016. We are the victims of a bloodless coup. He didn't win the general election. Yo, Electoral College, make Hillary Clinton president, period. Donald Trump is an illegitimate president. He's not a illegitimate president. Dems don't accept Trump as a legitimate president. This wasn't on the level. This election was not on the level. I don't think he's a legitimate president. Our election wasn't legit. He got his victory from cheating. Yes, Trump cheated. Trump cheated the 2016 election. He's an illegitimate president. No validity, no credibility. Mm. And because of that... Anger at what some see as an illegitimate president. Donald Trump has got to go. It will not be a peaceful change of power. A number of incidents turn violent. Protesters hurl trash cans, flash bombs, and objects at police. Several officers injured. Protesters threw rocks and smashed windows, leading to more confrontations, injuries, and arrests. Yep. The chaotic scene just blocks outside the secure area of the inauguration. If denying election results yeah. is extreme now, yeah. why would So let's, let's be really clear. That comparison that you made is just ridiculous. Protests against Donald Trump's election victory surged overnight, and some became violent. Violence erupted on the streets of Portland during the second straight day of protests over the election of Donald Trump. Some protesters launched fireworks and other projectiles at police. Several people began vandalizing cars. Some demonstrators smashed door windows. Protesters faced off with police in other cities, too, including Oakland, Denver, and Minneapolis. Violent protests continuing now for the third day in a row. Some 4,000 angry demonstrators over Trump's election victory taking to the streets. Officers in front of thousands of protesters in what police called a riot. Setting fires, taking their frustrations out on cars and buildings. Not my president! Not my People threw projectiles at officers and damaged property as well. I threw a trash can at them because I'm angry. One woman driving through was attacked as someone used a bat to smash her windshield. They are undermining our democratic process, everything that we stand for. Wow. What you just heard there, it's a propaganda campaign. And you, you heard first the campaign, Hillary saying... He's an illegitimate president. The election was stolen. And then people on the streets reacting to that. Very, very interesting. We forget these things, don't we? Here are people burning cities down, rioting, and they're called protesters by, by the mainstream media. And yet the January 6th people are insurrectionists. What's the difference? What's the difference? The difference is that the insurrectionist framework was stitched together by legacy media and the Democratic Party. And yet when their people do it, they're just pro... They did, never used the word riot, as far as I can tell. They were protesters, right? But at the January, of course, they're rioters. I mean, it's unbelievable how unfair the system is right now. But, but you also heard all of these commentators, all of these Democrat politicians saying that the election was stolen and hacked and all of that stuff. All of it lies... But if a Trump supporter says that 2020 was hinky, and it certainly looks like it was, uh, they're election deniers and they can't talk about it. So figure it out, people. If you like, I, I'm sure you get it by now, but this is absolutely an egregious, egregious example of, uh, of where America went south. And I, you know, I don't know if they'll be able to recover from maybe a generation, a generation from now, somebody will be able to reinstate the profession of, of journalism as an actual democratic pillar instead of the comms department for whatever lefty party happens to be in place. It's staggering when you think about it, isn't it? I just want to read to you a couple of things that uh, Glenn Greenwald said about the Durham report. You know, his husband died recently. He's been having a bad time. Our Glenn, I think his husband, they live in Rio, and they have a dog rescue there, which I think is great. They get homeless people to come in and look after the dog. So it's a lovely kind of mutually satisfying arrangement. And his husband died of some kind of sepsis infection brought about by some intestinal inflammation or something. And uh, it just sounds like it was an awful, awful time. But he's back on the job now, Glenn is. Sometimes that's the best thing to do, isn't it, when we're upset? So this is a bit of what he wrote about the Durham report. 
He says uh, the devastating revelations from the so-called Durham report, the final investigative document filed by special counsel John Durham, who in April 2019 was appointed and assigned by the Justice Department as someone along widely respected in Washington as an apolitical and trustworthy prosecutor. Are any of those left to investigate the single most scandalous aspect of Russia Gate? not the fictitious and ultimately non-existent collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government during the 2016 election, and most certainly not the completely unhinged, deranged, and wildly melodramatic conspiracy theory that dominated our political discourse for years, namely that the Kremlin had effectively seized control of the levers of American power through a combination of sexual, financial, and personal blackmail over Donald Trump. Instead, the most scandalous part of all of this was the abuse of power, the flagrant abuse of power by the FBI and the other parts of the U.S. security state to conduct a completely baseless investigation with the clear and not provable intent to interfere and manipulate the 2016 election to ensure the defeat of Donald Trump. That's what they did. The 306-page report sent to Congress by Attorney General Merrick Garland earlier this week is full of extremely incriminating indictments of the FBI and its senior leadership. We'll review the key findings and, most importantly, place them in the context of the last seven years of full-scale, highly illegal, and profoundly anti-democratic interference by the U.S. security state in our domestic politics and in two consecutive presidential elections. When he says we'll review, he's talking about on his show. One of the top three or four most significant political events of the last decade in the United States was the release in April 2019 of the final report by special counsel Robert Mueller. It may be easy to forget how significant that was, and that's because there has been a very concerted effort to foster this forgetting on the part of the American public about just how dominant that scandal was. That's one of the reasons I'm playing these tapes for you this today. It's not an exaggeration to say that Russiagate was the leading news story from mid-2016 when it first appeared as part of a campaign ad by Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump through at least the middle of 2019 when Robert Mueller finally concluded his investigation. And the reason I say the publication of the Mueller report was such a significant event one of the top three or four or five political events of the last decade is because the impetus for Russiagate, the core allegation that caused so much political turmoil and that suffocated and drowned our politics, and may I also say the Trump presidency, and and that ultimately led to the appointment of George Bush's post-9-11 FBI director Robert Mueller as a special counsel, was the claim that, again, emanated first from the Clinton campaign and that was spread by media outlets all over the place, driven by leaks from the intelligence community, was that the Trump campaign had colluded, a word we heard every day for years, and then it was nonsense, a word we heard every day for years, that he'd colluded with the Russian government in its attempts to hack into the emails of the Democratic National Committee. So that's the Mook tape that we heard earlier, as well as the personal inbox of John Podesta, who was also a mucky muck uh, Democrat. And the claim was that there was a criminal conspiracy between the Trump campaign on the one hand and the Russia government on the other to use foreign power and foreign influence to interfere in our democratic election. That was the central allegation. If you go back and read contemporaneous accounts of what led to the Mueller investigation, you will find with great clarity that that was the central accusation. So, folks, it was all bunkum. Years wasted. A presidency ruined. But you know what? Many, many, many journalism careers like Rachel Maddow's were made. People got very, 
very rich from reporting the lies about Donald Trump. There you go. So we'll see if there's a reckoning. Like I said, I want to have on the author of the Columbia Journalism Review multi-part series on how journalists got this wrong. We'll do a deep dive. And and the reason we're going to do it, I know the Durham Report and Russiagate is a very American story, but what happened there happens here on a smaller scale. There's no question about that. Journalism's changed. It now sees itself as, as a a group whose job it is to police on behalf of the left. They call it social justice, but they're talking about leftist ideology. That's what they're doing. So um, we're going to be doing that really, really soon. Like maybe even next week, if he's up to it, we'll be ready to go, to go ahead with that. So I want to talk to you now about another big journalistic failure. We talk about it a lot on this show too, and that was the absolute abdication of responsibility by the media, especially the CBC here in Canada, during COVID-19. They bought into a narrative, they supported the narrative, they smeared and shunned any expert who wasn't down with the narrative, they assured us that the vaccines were safe and effective, safe and effective, and that lockdowns were the way, and my God, why are we opening up schools? Let's keep them. That's what they did. They did it for two and a half years. And I I will tell you something. I used to sit and watch the news conferences of these public health officials and say to myself, well, why aren't they asking this? Why aren't they asking for proof that lockdowns are working? Why aren't they asking for more information about the vaccines? Why aren't we allowed to say that a product that was tested for a very short period of time doesn't have long-term data? It doesn't. That's just a fact. But we weren't. We were not allowed to do that. And I will say that I haven't seen his evidence, but Rodney Palmer was back at the NCI yesterday, so you should go to their website and see if you can find it. Um, And so was Marianne Cloak, who appeared on my show. We had the first exclusive interview with her when she decided to step out of the shadows and talk about her experience with the CBC. I think I'll read this little bit after, after we listen to Marianne, but the Trusted News Initiative was behind a lot of what we were hearing about vaccines from legacy media. All of these news organizations signed up to this this body that was declaring what and what was not true about vaccines as if they are the oracle. I mean, science is about debating stuff. There's no proof, one proof of something. You have to debate it. And the Trusted News Initiative, although it has this wonderful title, was actually all about shutting down the scientific debate that we needed. So so that may have been what was playing out in Marianne Cloak's life when she was working at CBC and trying to do stories on vaccines. So here is a clip of Marianne Cloak in conversation with me. So at this time when I had this meeting with management and I said, you know, we got to be really cautious here. This could become another thalidomide. Um, I was contacted by and connected with a group of parents and they were, this was at the time when uh, they were talking about uh, vaccinating youth and um, a number of parents had contacted me and their concerns were like, well, we, first of all, they didn't agree with this. Some of them were saying like, why is it that our children 12 and up can get this vaccine without parental authority? And if my child has an adverse reaction, who's responsible? And then it was other parents saying, you know, this is experimental. We don't agree with this. Uh, And they were all citing uh, this research um, that was put out by Dr. Byron Bridal. And uh, so, I, and one of the stories was just amazing in terms of what was developing in communities, in terms of, um, you know, dividing people, dividing families, dividing neighborhoods. Um, an example would be, as mother was telling me, uh, she lived in a small, smaller community and her daughter was, was best friends with this, this other girl who lived close by. And uh, one family was, was, you know, getting the vaccine. One family wasn't getting the vaccine. And her uh, daughter told her, um, she says, you know what? So-and-so texted me and said, if I want to get the vaccine, uh, if I want to get the shot, I can come over to their house, sleep over. Her mom would take her and her own mother would never have to know. Wow. 
And I, I just, I thought this was shocking what this was doing, where kids were being, you know, ostracized at school and segregated from birthday parties. So anyways, these parents, I was in communication with them and they had a lot of concerns in terms of, you know, is it safe for my kid to get the shot? Isn't it? And I had pitched this story to them at this same meeting where I, I, I mentioned the the thalidomide concern. And, you know, so they gave me, they gave me the green light to, to do the story. So I thought this is great. So I I got these parents on, on the record on tape. And then I went to uh, the COVID care Alliance and um, I I know you've done stories on them in the past, but they were an organization that actually formed because of, of COVID because they had a dissenting view in terms of what the government was presenting doctors, uh, healthcare professionals, scientists. And, um, and I had a, a long conversation with um, uh, one of the, uh, well, the spokesperson for the group. And he was uh, out of UBC and he went through some of the data with me and uh, explained it to me and uh, what his concerns were and laid them out. And also the fact that they were, they had filed um, a petition uh, that they were uh, putting forward to the federal government. And it was calling for to suspend, you know, vaccines in children, youth, um, adults of childbearing age, pregnant women, until there were more short and long-term safety trials that were completed, you know, and, and published mm-hmm. in peer-reviewed journals. So I had I'd gotten him on tape and, you know, I was working at a home at the time, so it was all on Zoom. And it, it made it through... Uh, and I thought, well, this is totally newsworthy. This is up until now, all we had been hearing was safe and effective, safe and effective, and no dissenting voices. So I thought, this is great. This is a story that's going to try to punch a hole in the narrative to move it forward. So it, it cleared the vetting process locally by the, um, you know, the managing editor and the senior exec. And then the copy editor had a look at it and she says, you know, like, uh, you know, maybe we should hear from Pfizer, but this is, you know, a story that maybe the Toronto health unit should have a look at. And this, this to me was just shocking because I thought, well, we've had all these stories and, and all the stories I've ever done in my entire career, nothing was ever forwarded to the Toronto health unit. And, and, you know, I, I did some deep dives in the story where I, I had a look at the Pfizer data and uh, what these some of these doctors and scientists were saying. And, you know, basically one of their concerns was about vaccinating youth was that, um, you know, in the, in the, the trial studies, um, according to the data that I looked at by Pfizer, there was only 1,100 adolescents between 12 and 15 in the U.S., that were vaccinated in phase three of the trials. And, you know, the COVID care alliance was saying this was problematic because if there was a reaction, let's say that was one in 3000, we wouldn't know because that pool wasn't deep enough. So, you know, the story had, had, um, you know, cleared the vetting process here. I had looked at the Pfizer data uh, and then this copywriter flagged it and then it did go to the Toronto health unit. And I said, okay, fine. So how long is this going to take? Um, and they said, well, it'll probably be a couple, a couple of weeks or so um, till we hear back. And I thought, okay, so this is, you know, um, already we were heading into the end of the end of July, or sorry, the end of June, the beginning of July. So, uh, so, so what happened? It was July eighth. Um, I was calling to a meeting with our local exec, and I actually brought a witness into that meeting as well that I asked to be present. And, you know, I was told over Zoom that the uh, Toronto Health Unit uh, had concerns about my story. And I said, so what were those concerns? And they said, well, you know, the first thing I want to mention is is nothing uh, that I had written in the piece, the, the data, the research, the numbers, none of that was questioned. The two issues that were raised were, did I know that the COVID care Alliance promoted ivermectin? And did I know that some of the members of the Alliance chose to be anonymous? And so quickly, you know, what registered is all right. So now the story is being blocked further up the chain. So, and the thing was like, ivermectin was not the focus of the piece. And if this group was supporting it, and you know, maybe that should be a story we should be airing that we should be, uh, putting forward research on both sides of the issue of, of the use of ivermectin. We all heard uh, the debate. And, and later on, when I did speak with someone in Toronto 
uh, the head of journalistic standards, he says that was the most heat that they did take in Toronto was the the issue of ivermectin. But going back to what happened, you know, and I says, as for anonymous, um, that was the other criticism. I said, I don't understand why you're saying that because the person I interviewed, which was Steve Pellick, uh, went full face on camera with his name used. So I, I wasn't sure where that was coming from. Um, but they didn't, just to be clear, because I think this is important, that they did not, they did not argue against the story on the basis of data. Is that correct? That's totally correct. Yeah. That's totally correct. The copy editor who flagged it said, you know, well, maybe we should have Pfizer in there. And I said, well, we've heard enough from Pfizer in terms of safe and effectiveness. We have not heard any voices on the other side. And the fact that this group was launching a national petition was newsworthy in my mind, as well as these parents' concerns, because these were voices we hadn't heard, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but then w what they suggested next to me, uh, you know, I, I was dumbfounded. I, I was just left speechless. It was, you know, what what I was asked being asked to do was saying, okay, so we're going to drop the COVID care alliance out of this story. Uh, there's a we believe there's a story to be told in terms of what the the parents are concerns are, um, but we want you to take the parental concerns and talk to two two people in Toronto, two experts that the the health unit had recommended, and. Uh, you know, I, I later, I did check out who these people were. I had a conversation with one of them um, and they were experts that were reinforcing the narrative, you know, supporting the vaccination of young people. So at that point, I went back to management and I said, you know what, um, I, I can't do this. What you're asking me to do is journalistically unethical. It's manipulating information. Um, this doesn't sit well with me. And um you know, these parents were backing up the science of the alliance, and you were asking me to remove them from this story and put in two more voices supporting the vaccination of young people. And to me, it was just dishonest. It was a dishonest thing to do. And it, I, it was immoral for me as well, um, because not only were we canceling credible voices, we, we were violating our own principles of, you know, balance and, and fairness. And, you know, so this is what I did. I mean, I, I I did not want to be part of this. I did not want my name attached to this story. So I said to the senior exec, I am, I'm standing down from this story. I'm walking away from this because more like I couldn't do what they were asking me to do by, you know, censoring an entire group of credible professionals because just because they had a different viewpoint on this. And so what happened as a result of you standing down from the story? Did it go ahead or no? No, it didn't. It died. And uh, it died on the table. And so what I did at that point is is I, I called back everyone I interviewed and I, I had to apologize to them. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I can't go forward with this. Um, you know, and this had been months in the making. And I said, and here's why. And I, and I told them why. I said, um, the story was being manipulated in a way that to me was not you know, reflective of the truth of what I was hearing and seeing from people and voices that were credible and people with credentials and, and you know, had published hundreds of peer reviewed articles. And I'm thinking this is not right. And and it was just, again, moving the story towards the narrative and um, not allowing dissenting dissenting voices to be heard. So that was the brave Marianne Cloak on my show. But as I said earlier, if you want to hear her testimony to the NCI, please go to their website. It's worth it. She's brave. And um, I'm really proud of her for speaking out. It's a really hard thing for her to do. I know she's had her struggles around it. We've talked about it. But um, she always does the right thing. And she does the right thing because she cares about journalism as I do. That is what this is about. You cannot have a working democracy without an objective news media, or at least a news media trying to be somewhat objective. We'll take that. That's okay compared to what we have now, which are news organizations worldwide who think their job is to support leftist ideology. And that's what they do. 
in the name of social justice, they've completely corrupted themselves. Now, what may have been playing a role in the way the CBC was mishandling reporting on COVID-19 and specifically the vaccines is that they belong to something called the Trusted News Initiative, which you may or may not, I've mentioned it on the show. I didn't know all that much about it. I've done more looking. Rodney Palmer talks about it too. He also gave a new presentation, I believe, to the NCI yesterday, so you should look for that too. Um, So here is the BBC, who is also really failing, uh, putting out a, from their media center, a document that says trusted news initiative tni to combat spread of harmful vaccine disinformation and announces major research project at a recent summit chaired by the bbc's new director general tim davy the trusted news initiative tni agreed to focus on combating the spread of harmful vaccine information so here we have all these high mucky mucks in journalism thinking they can really just figure it out, right? They're going to they're tell us what we should think and what we shouldn't think. And given how corrupt they are, we, they're, they're even less likely to be able to vet this information. They've proven that themselves. They thought their whole job was to stay safe and effective until we passed out from the onslaught of it all. You know, that's all they did. So what this is such nonsense. It makes me crazy. The Trusted News Initiative partners will continue to work together to ensure legitimate concerns about future vaccinations are heard whilst harmful disinformation myths are stopped in their tracks. Tim Davey, Director General. Okay, Tim, so how many actual stories have you done about legitimate, authentic vaccine injuries? How many stories have you done about the shot's efficacy waning and the fact that it doesn't prevent transmission at all. When did you start reporting that, if you reported it at all? I doubt it. But they know best, don't they? They know best. To quote Basil Fawlty, they know best. And here's what it says. With the introduction of several possible new COVID-19 vaccines, this was written in December of 2020, there has been a rise of anti-vaccine disinformation spreading online to millions of people. Examples include widely shared memes which link falsehoods about vaccines to freedom and individual liberty. So, no, we were linking the mandates, not the vaccines, the mandates. See how dishonest they are? Ugh. Other posts seek to downplay the risks of coronavirus and suggest there is an ulterior motive behind the development of a vaccine. That is also really dishonest, and I will tell you why. Because what they call downplaying the risk of the threat of of coronavirus more than likely was people who'd actually read the risk stratification data and realized that 99.9% of the people are not at risk from dying of COVID-19. Therefore, vaccinating everybody with a not well-tested vaccine and locking down the country and closing schools was a really dumb idea. We base that on data. And organizations like the BBC, the CBC, and of course all the American networks treated the risk from a bad COVID-19 outcome as if it were even across the board. Oh, yes, they acknowledged that you know long-term care and older people died of it, but they didn't acknowledge who didn't die of it, right? They kept that door open the whole time to keep people scared. So that so Tim Davy, just remember this, people, if you watch the CBC, the guy who wrote this, Tim Davy, the director general of the BBC. This is how dumb he is. He's either dumb or completely dishonest. Neither one of those is a good thing when they're evaluating what we're going to see and hear, right? And this includes on the CBC. Whilst it is important to scrutinize the science behind new COVID-19 vaccines and give voice to legitimate concerns from people wondering what a coronavirus vaccine means for them, questions about levels of immunity and whether a vaccine is appropriate for those with chronic health conditions, it is vital that audiences know they can turn to sources they trust for accurate, impartial information. You mean the people who are saying that natural immunity is not a thing? You mean those organizations like the legacy media? That's science? That's their impartial information? I don't think so, Tim. TNI partners will alert each other to disinformation, which poses an immediate threat to life. So content can be reviewed promptly by platforms, whilst publishers ensure they don't unwittingly 
republish dangerous falsehoods. He doesn't say what they are, does he? No. The TNI is already working together to tackle the spread of harmful coronavirus information and previously has had success running a rapid alert system. What? During the UK 2019 general election, Myanmar and Taiwan 2020 general elections and the US presidential election. Oh my God, they were involved in the 2020. No wonder everything went to rat shit. Tim Davey, director general of the BBC says 2020 has been a year like no other. We have seen the rapid spread of harmful disinformation and a growing number of conspiracy theories online. Whether it's a threat to our health or a threat to our democracy, there is a human cost to disinformation. So what is the disinformation, Tim? What is it? What is it? Tell us. The Trusted News Initiative partners will continue to work together, meaning collude, to expand our framework and ensure legitimate concerns about future vaccinations are heard, yeah, right, whilst harmful disinformation myths are stopped in their tracks. All of these orgs that are members of the TNI were had to be dragged kicking and screaming to even mention myocarditis, right? They, they fought against it tooth and nail. They're still fighting against it tooth and nail. It's insane. So, but... This document, let me tell you what it's really about. What it's really about is that they know these broadcast media organizations, let me just name who they are, um, are losing ground. They're losing the trust of the viewing and listening and reading public. We don't believe them anymore. So they're doubling down and they're doubling down by accusing the people who are thinking more critically about information like us on this show and Glenn and Matt and all the other smart people, they're a threat to the legacy media and legacy media knows it. So they're trashing everybody now as disinformation specialists. It's disgusting. So I just want to say to you who, okay, here are the members of the trusted news initiative. The partners currently within the TNI are AP, that's Associated Press, AFP, that's Agence France Press, BBC, CBC Radio Canada, European Broadcasting Union, Facebook, Financial Times, First Draft, which I believe is a fact-checking organization, which means people who support the narrative only, Google, YouTube, the Hindu... It just says the Hindu, but I think they mean probably the Hindu Times. Microsoft, Reuters, Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Reuters has been one of the worst, by the way, uh, of getting things wrong and accusing everybody of disinformation. Twitter and the Washington Post. So there you go. That's what's happening at the CBC. Odious, odious, odious. Honestly, let the investigative journalists individually determine how they're going to cover vaccines. A blanket policy pushed through an ever-narrowing tunnel toward Tim Davey or anybody else who thinks they know everything is not the right way to go. And Marianne Cloak it was perfectly capable of reporting on vaccines in her job at the CBC, and she was prevented from doing so. And uh, all of these policies are responsible for a lot of heartbreak in many, many countries right now. So, yeah, if you hear TNI, head for the hills. They're not fact-checking. They're narrative-stitching and covering their own butts because they're losing audience. So the last thing I just want to bring to your attention is another attack on Bobby Kennedy. It's quite funny. You know, they can't ever lay a hand on him. Um, even though I look, I don't know how I feel about his position on vaccines causing autism. I'm open. I look since COVID-19 and the fiasco that it was and the absolutely obvious denunciation of mainstream science that it was too. I'm open-minded about everything that I'm open-minded about climate change. So-called I'm open-minded about vaccines causing autism. I wasn't before I thought it was settled science, but now I'm, st- I'm starting to question everything. But at this point, I don't know if Bobby Kennedy's right or wrong. I suspect he might be wrong, but he's entitled to his opinion and he has no agenda. So here's what happens. They've got this Democratic candidate who sounds kind of like a populist, sounds like an anti-globalist, understands COVID-19 quite well. 
but has a controversial position on vaccines. So the media doesn't know what to do with that. <laughs> it's really funny. I brought you a couple of weeks ago a clip of some poor, demented woman at ABC who um, didn't even try really to go head to head with Bobby on the data. She just let him spout and then edited him out of the interview stealthily and then and cop to it when she was delivering the interview she said yes we edited out his you know controversial misinformation or whatever about vaccines and my thing is if the guy is so wrong then get briefed deep dive what he's saying and take him on right he's not an oaf he's not an ogre you can argue with bobby he's trained as a lawyer he's used to it he probably likes it right and the thing about this vaccine issue and Bobby Kennedy is that there are things I do want to ask him hard questions about. You know, why is he running Democrat when Joe Biden is the worst president ever and it's a hugely corrupt party right now? I, I think it's terrible that he's running as a Democrat. And I also think he needs to renounce some of his former views and explain that he's changed his mind and why he changed his mind. I think that's fair game and I'm sure he does too. But they all have to get Bobby on the vaccine autism thing. That's the goal. I don't know why. It shows how crazed they are. Did Pfizer tell them that? Why are they so focused on that story? So here's what happened. He's interviewed by this young woman named Crystal Ball. That's really her name. Who does a show called Breaking Point with Sagar and Jetty. Uh, they used to have a show, I think, for the Hill or the Hills or something. Um, but they left and they've got this podcast like everybody in the podcast now and so i guess she really kind of did a deep dive on the data took on bobby and massively massively failed and we're going to play that for you to hear it's crystal ball and bobby kennedy and she is clearly trying to score here and as i said it's like the road runner you know she she can't she can't catch him she can't get him so let me ask you about vaccines. This is an area where you and I have um, significant differences. And, you know, just to level with you on this, like a lot of what you say, I really respond to. I think you're a very genuine person. But the across the board, um, whether you want to call it vaccine skepticism or anti-vax advocacy, which has been a central part of what you've been up to for the past number of years, for me personally, it's a it's an issue and it's a it's a real sort of red line. And I know I'm not alone in that, especially running in a Democratic primary. There are going to be other millions of people like me who have similar concerns. So how how do you win them over? What's your message to people who think like I do? Well, but just tell me, um, tell me where you think I got it wrong. Well, I think you get it wrong when you draw a uh, correlation between the rise of things like autism and the introduction of vaccines when there isn't hard scientific evidence tying those things together. How do you I, know? Let, let me ask you this. How do you know there's not a hard scientific evidence? Well, because the one major study that purported to show that was retracted and the scientist who conducted it was, um, you know, had to... Was now, what you're doing now, Basically Crystal. fraudulently created. Listen, uh, I don't... No, no, no. Uh, hold on, hold on. You're, you're but I don't, I don't want to get... I don't want to get in a debate with you about this because you've spent your life... Pulling out this study, that I will and tell I, you. I I will, tell let you, me just tell you. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Let me just tell you. I'm not. Paid. I've listened to hours of interviews with you with an, yeah. an open mind, and I'm not persuaded. But first of all, I'm not leading with you know my opinions about vaccines. But what I say to people is, show me where I got it wrong. Show me that where I got my science wrong. I've written books about this. I've, and if I got something wrong, show me where it is. But I think people uh, have shown you where things are no, wrong, well, no, no, but you don't want to hear well, it. Is because I've seen you know numerous fact checks. Dr. Vinay Prasad, who we you know really respect on uh, the COVID vaccine, he went through your interview with All In. He did a fact check. I mean, it's not. And, and I people did have, a fact check of Vinay, and you should read that. I will take a look at it. But uh, uh, I don't but, think that it's fair to Chris, say well, nobody me, has ever pointed out anything that's been, uh, that's been I, wrong. Well, here's what I, people complain about what I say. Mm. And I, again, I'm not leading on this issue, so people can either take it or leave it. But if you want to, you know, I... What you just said about me, that I'm sort of hard-headed and stubborn and just won't give in, you're wrong about that. If somebody shows me where I'm wrong, I'm going to correct it. If in A. Prasad, when he did his piece, if he showed me a science that was valid, 
I would say I would change my position. If but we got the two read, of you together, would my, you, so, you know, read my this, response to it. So you say this isn't what you're leading with, but I just have to say, as someone who, you know, is is watching your candidacy closely and is aware of the advocacy you've been doing and you know the organization that you um, are involved with, it's hard for me to believe this won't be an important part of how you govern. So I think that's the most important piece for people to get. Who you have to accept, there are going to be people like me who just don't agree with you on this. Um, you, you know, certainly understand that there are many who do think that the vaccines that we have are more beneficial than harmful, that, you know, got their kids vaccinated and are gr happy for that decision. Um, so how is this going to impact the way that you govern or does it not at all? I mean, I, I'm going to govern according to, you know, what evidence-based medicine. Oh, uh, that's, you know, that's so the it, way. Let me, let me give a specific question. If there's another pandemic, in the last pandemic, uh, former President Trump, something we gave him a lot of credit for, he launched Operation Warp Speed. Um, they had a whole of government approach. They used the mRNA technology that was developed using you know, US taxpayer dollars to get a vaccine out to the population as quickly as possible. How would your approach have differed? My approach would have been a science-based approach. Which means what? Which means, uh, and a, and a medicine-based approach, the approach that has been used for, you know, for, and approved for decades. You look first at therapeutics that are off the shelf, and you look at the efficacy at, of those. I mean, what I would have done if I was in power then, I would have created an information grid because now we have this internet that is supposed to benefit us and has become, Instead, an instrument for, you know, um, totalitarian control, but let's use it for something good. Let's link all 15 million doctors, frontline physicians all over the world and find out what they're doing to treat this new respiratory virus. So would a vaccine did, development we did, be part we did of that Well, you know, I don't think the vaccine worked. I think, you know, if you think it worked, then try to explain to me why the countries that were unvaccinated did much better than our than well, our many our, of those countries because there are a lot of different factors well, in various countries. So a lot of I, those countries, as you pointed out before, why do we, we have hold why on, do we hold have on. the highest death rate well, count in, in the world by far? I think there are a lot of factors that may go into that. Yeah. One of them is the fact that we are disproportionately obese as a society. We have the negative health and outcomes that you've been that? talking about. We don't go outside as much as countries say in Africa. I mean, we have there are a lot of different factors that may play into that. But I will I will say. Did the vaccines work in the way they were initially promised to prevent spread? No, I don't think so, especially once you got to later variants. Let me tell you something. I, what I believe you're doing now is you're parroting what the public health agencies have been saying, but they do not have a scientific basis for that. And I have another book out that you should look at called Died Suddenly that goes through all the Johns Hopkins data, which is the you know dashboard data that everybody used. Mm and shows exactly what happened. So you are more, if you got vaccinated, you're more likely to get sick, you're more likely to get severe illness, and you're more likely to die than if you were unvaccinated. I have not seen that. I have well, that, seen well, study after study have... that shows the opposite. Yeah, so that was Crystal Ball taking on Bobby Kennedy. And I don't know what the point of that interview was. I mean, she's not, she was, I don't know what she was doing. He's not, she's not gonna change his mind. He's not gonna change her mind. They might as well move on. But I mean, she does at the end of it say that they will post, each one will post their own data or something like that. So I, I think that's not a bad idea. I think that's probably the way it should, the way it should happen. But what's interesting about listening to these kind of mainstream podcasts, I don't think that Crystal and Sagar think that they're mainstream, but they are, um, is how much of what they say is a talking point. She said she'd seen study after study. I'd like to know what study she's citing because um, very, very much about what, of what Bobby says about vaccine efficacy is true. It was not, it didn't work. It was not efficacious. It faded. And then there is the default. It's like the defaulting to long COVID. There is the default position that, well, it didn't stop transmission, but it did make people less sick. I, you know, so, uh, is that why you were mandating everybody take it? Is that why, gee, I thought you were mandating so that it wasn't going to be uh, transmitted all over the place. That's what you said. You know, it's it's a, what do you call it? It's a shifting goalpost constantly. And, and what's shifting is not the science. It's the way the bureaucrats talk about the science, which is hugely... Um, destabilizing when you listen to it and know what's happening. 
Okay. So that was uh, Crystal Ball on her show, Breaking Point Podcast. Um, I want to end with a couple things. I uh, have a lovely email from someone who emailed me about my show uh, that I did a couple weeks ago where I interviewed Harold Jonker. I don't know if it's Jonker or Jonker. I'm not too sure how you pronounce it. He didn't correct me when I said Jonker, so that must be correct. He is the trucker from Ontario who was just charged in connection with his participation in the in the convoy. I mean, really, what is the crown in Ottawa doing? Why are they charged? I mean, but look, nobody should be charged, but why are they charging this guy this long after the events? And he had to go to, I haven't talked to him since he went, but he had to go to Ottawa or has to go to Ottawa. And, oh, it's just ghastly. Anyway, it was a lovely interview and he seems like a very nice man. So this is what my little note says from a listener, a man in Toronto named Phil. Thanks, Trish, for this interview. Not that I'm conventionally religious or that this will be of any use to you, but Harold's statement about being charged by the Niagara Regional Police was an occasion for, in quotes, two brothers in the Lord to hug, end quote. That's what Mr. Jonker said and his faith that the outcome of his criminal process was in God's hands. It made me cry somewhat unexpectedly. It was very noble. He's a a noble guy. I've been taught by my meditation teacher that the only effective way to deal with painful emotions is to allow them to be fully experienced without resistance. I have found that to be true and effective. However, I find it challenging to allow myself to fully experience the feelings I have when I become and learn how decent, innocent, working class people, let me say that again. However, I find it challenging to follow, however, I find it challenging to allow myself to fully experience the true feelings I have when I learn how decent, innocent, working class people like Mr. Jonker, were and are being attacked by mendacious elites who profess their own virtue. Warm regards. Phil in Toronto. Isn't that lovely? I had the same reaction when he said that. I I almost couldn't believe it. But I find that in moments where somebody who's being persecuted finds a little bit of grace in the ugliness of it, that that's very very uplifting and very spiritual for me. So I think that's probably what Phil was responding to. And I'm so grateful for that note. So we've talked a lot about the media today and their epic, epic, epic failures and what that means for us. And it's as bad as you could possibly ever imagine giving the complete repudiation of the Russia hoax by the Durham report. And I hope we're going to be doing a big show on specifically on the journalism around that. Uh, There was a great piece, as I said, written in the Columbia journalism review, which is a big deal. Uh, And he, he's agreed to come on the show, the person who wrote it, but he's not feeling well. So hopefully it'll be next week and we can pick up where we left off here. It's really important. How do you write a story about something that never happened? I mean, what what are you writing then? I mean, did, are you listening to sources who are totally BSing you? And if they're BSing you, you should be mad at them and outing them. That's what that's. Those are the rules, folks. You know, you you protect your sources that you've given um, privacy to by going to jail. As journalists have gone to jail, Judith Miller went to jail, the New York Times reporter, who actually was doing a really bad job. But the principal was the right, the right principal. She was the big curveball, weapons of mass destruction pusher. But she did did have principle about not revealing the source. Um, but I think in the case where they've burnt you and it's been so damaging to the country, you have a right to out them. So the question is, why aren't they doing it? They're not. They, they're not outing their wrong sources because they were playing along. They were part of that apparatus, weren't they? So I'm just going to leave you with something to ponder as I say goodbye. And that is Jake Tapper again. Poor Jake. I don't mean to pick on him because they were all equally bad, but he does have these delicious 
clips. So you heard earlier that in 2016, Robbie Mook was pushing the Trump Russia hoax and the hack of the DNC emails that was not a hack by Russia when it wasn't Russia to bail Hillary out of a jam since she was cheating to win the primary from Bernie cheating. Um, And so here's Jake Tapper again a year later, mostly just sort of reporting that the dossier, which has been completely repudiated or parts of it are real. So I'm going to say goodbye and stay critical. And we will leave you with this odious reporting by CNN. Stay critical. See ya. We have some breaking news now. CNN has learned new information about that ongoing investigation into those allegations raised in a collection of memos created by a former British intelligence agent at the time he made the memos for political opponents of then-candidate Donald Trump. Jim Shuto and Evan Perez have been working the story. And Jim, let's start with you. What precisely have investigators learned? Well, Jake, for the first time, U.S. investigators say that they have corroborated some of the communications detailed in a 35-page dossier compiled by a former British intelligence agent. CNN was first to report last month that then-president-elect Donald Trump and President Barack Obama were briefed on the existence of the memos prior to the inauguration. Until now, U.S. officials have said that none of the content or allegations have been verified. But now, multiple current and former U.S. law enforcement and intelligence officials tell CNN that intelligence intercepts of foreign nationals confirmed that some of the conversations described in the dossier took place between the same individuals on the same days and from the same locations as detailed in the dossier. We should be clear that CNN has not confirmed the content of the calls or whether any of the content relates to then-candidate Trump. And none of the newly learned information relates, I should say, to the salacious allegations in the dossier. The corroboration, based on intercepted communications has given U.S. intelligence and law enforcement, quote, greater confidence in the credibility of some aspects of the dossier as they continue to actively investigate its contents, these sources say. Reached for comment this afternoon, White House spokesman Sean Spicer said, quote, we continue to be disgusted by CNN's fake news reporting. Spokesman for the FBI, the Department of Justice, the CIA, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence had no comment. Fake news is what they call any news they don't like. 